Two friends, Alan Dale and Jerry Carew, who grew up just a few streets apart in St. John's East End, have been separated by Canada's geography for three decades. They came together virtually during the pandemic to chat about like-minded interests. Alan lives in PEI and Jerry in Newfoundland. Thriving in remoteness has been a common theme for both of them during the pandemic. Gale Force wins. The podcast is the result. Okay, buddy, we're recording. All right. Well, Jerry, here we are, man. We're about to set sail on board HMCS Toronto. This is a pretty exciting time for us. We get to talk to some sailors in the Canadian Navy, and we're about to depart historic St. John's. When was the last time you left St. John's on a ship? Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about it, it uh, and, I, and I'm pretty certain I nailed it down. Um, 1986, and the reason I say that, I was in British Columbia for Expo 86, and, and it dawned on me. I flew back and got on the ship, and and I think when we were talking to some of the other sailors, I realized what ship it was. I right. believe it was the HMCS Annapolis. Yeah. So. I don't think the Annapolis is around anymore. That's <laughs> dating yourself. But listen, Jerry, this is a pretty complex warship, HMCS Toronto. We've had the pleasure already to talk to some of the people that make this ship function, and over the course of the next two days, we're going to talk to every single person that does an occupation on board, so we learn exactly how this ship operates. So the next time Canadians see this ship go by, they'll know that there's a lot of people in there making it all function. Well, you know, uh, it's funny, we've interviewed a few already. What time is it? We're getting ready to sail, it's 11.18. You know what struck me, Alan? We've talked to some amazing entrepreneurs. Yeah. But I tell you, some of the people we've already spoken to here today, they have their shit together. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, especially around that helicopter right. that's primarily where we spend most of our time already I mean just think of these young people keeping that thing in the air yeah wow well, complex work these folks are doing complex work on a moving platform in the middle of the ocean it's pretty impressive and I can't wait to dive into more right. conversations on Gale Force Winds so we're about to sail out of St. John's jury's gonna get lots of footage of that and it's gonna be an exciting couple of days uh, phenomenal uh, I'm looking forward to it yeah great well here we are on board HMCS Toronto. Gale Force Winds is about to set sail with the Canadian Navy and what an exciting time it's going to be. It's all about talking to sailors and the first guy that we're going to speak to is Donnie McDonald from Cape Breton. Donnie, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, so good morning everybody. Uh, Pit Officer First Class Donnie McDonald. Uh, like you just stated, I was uh, originally born in Sydney and then uh, moved to, uh, to, uh, to Dartmouth. So uh, I grew up in Dartmouth, went to, to school in Dartmouth and, uh, and everything like that. So I'm a petty officer first class. My trade uh, occupation is Naval Electronic Sensor Operator. Uh, so I uh, was the uh, above water warfare director on board uh, HMC of Charlottetown prior to uh, moving into this new position. We're going to unpack all of that, Donnie, as we go along. But tell me this, you grew up in Dartmouth, you joined the Navy to see the world. I did. How far did you get? Uh, I, I've been pretty far. So <laughs> tell us about that. Uh, I had some pretty cool experiences, and it's 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 actually really really nice being back on Toronto. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get to sail back with Toronto today. Uh, but I was posted to Toronto in uh, 2007, so I got the opportunity to deploy on a, a NATO mission with Toronto. Uh, and then I also did uh, 2013. I did Operation Artemis on Toronto, where we got a chance to go over to uh, to the Middle East, and we actually uh, circumnavigated Africa. So we went to Cape Town, South Africa, went to Seychelles, and all the way through, and then back and uh, back home, so it was fantastic. Tell us a little bit about what your occupation does on board. Like, what, what does that do on board the ship? So my occupation is a Naval Electronic Sensor Operator, so I'm the Above Water Warfare Director as my position as a Pet Officer First Class. Uh, so I handle all the above water side. We also have a, an ASWIC or an AWO who handles the underwater. Uh, so in terms of uh, fire control, we have the 57 millimeter gun on the uh, forecastle. We also have the SeaWiz close and weapon system and our, uh, our, um, our, our missiles as well. So we have uh, the Evolve Sea Sparrow and Harpoon. So that's primarily my job is uh, self-defense. So I uh, come up with the plans, uh, make recommendations to the, uh, the ops, uh, operations room officer. Right. I take all the information that's basically compiled through the ops room in regards to uh, you know, the surface and air picture, yeah. uh, and then kind of take all that, process it, make recommendations uh, to, the, uh, to the ORO, to the captain. Uh, if ever we were, you know, being attacked or had to defend the ship, that is, that is my job. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's, it's a lot of training. Uh, I had uh, a section of uh, 12 to 14 people, all junior, uh, junior knee subs from sailor third class all the way up to petty officer second class. Uh, and I've obviously sailed on all, in all those roles and positions prior to uh, being the, the senior knee sub. 
you worked your way right up to I the did. point where you're kind of controlling all the weapon yep. systems and uh, so you, you kind of talk about above water and underwater is warfare divided up that way on a ship it is so in terms of positions and the way the ops room is laid out uh, so on the on the port side is where the where the knee stops hang out uh, so myself uh, as a as a naval electronic sensor operator and, and being the above water warfare director uh, I w uh, as a P1, I would also have a lieutenant, yeah. so an officer counterpart who would have the same qualification and course that I have, and we split our watches, so he would be on one watch, uh, port or starboard, and then on the other side of the ops, from the starboard side, we have the uh, the ASWIC or the uh, or yes, the ASWIC or the uh, the UO, so the underwater warfare officer. So again, P1 and a, and a lieutenant, and they handle all the underwater, and they do the exact same thing I do, uh, just not as busy, obviously. Right. Uh, and they take that information underwater, same process, compile it and bring it as uh, recommendations to the ORO yeah. uh, if we ever face with an underwater threat and uh, and obviously training and all that right. type of stuff as well. Donnie, sounds like there's a lot of moving parts there, to there that is. job, right? Is, I mean, yeah. there's got to be a lot of information flowing around the operations room on board a ship like this. How do you manage that? So it's just, uh, I'd say over the time and, and being in every position, you learn that experience and you learn how to cope with that and how to process that. And by the time you get to the, the rank of P1 or, or Lieutenant and you're in that position, you have the, you know, you work through, the, through that sequence of steps and you know what to do with it, where, to, where it needs to go. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a lot of responsibility. Um, I'm a, I like to, to say I'm a very organized person. So, right. you know, I take lots of notes. I, I you know, I prepare in, in before briefs and lectures. And obviously anytime we do a gun shoot, you know, we have uh, messages that have to be released. Uh, you know, pre-firing briefs right. and safety and ammunition that has to be organized and prepared. So there's a lot of planning that goes into that. So you're you're uh, from the sailor third class level all the way to pedestrian or first class. You're you're constantly planning and preparing, and you're, it's a sequence of steps and courses that kind of build build up right. to the point where you do get uh, to the position of above water warfare director or whatever your director level might be. Um, they kind of have all that weighed off, and right. I feel like once you get to that level, you're you're ready to go. It sounds like a pretty amazing job. It's, it's been fun. It's yeah, been tell me fun. about some of the adventures you've had in the Navy. Like, what's your favorite experience? Uh, I don't really know if I have a favorite experience. I've, uh, I've taken part in a lot of different exercises, uh, multinational exercises, Joint Warrior, um, you know, Trident Juncture, and uh, lots of uh, overseas. Uh, uh, one of my, actually, you know what? One of my favorite uh, experiences, I think, was I was uh, previous to Charlottetown, I was coxswain on board HMCS Clays Bay. Uh, and then transition is coxswain on uh, Kingston, so Kingston class. Yeah. Uh, so being a NESOP, we have no position uh, on a Kingston class, so I really didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and I only knew one other NESOP in the past that was on a Kingston class as coxswain. So uh, it was a little overwhelming at first, but I ended up getting posted to uh, HMCS Glace Bay, which is kind of cool because my grandmother uh, lives in, lived that in Glace cool. Bay. My, yeah. uh, a lot of roots and, and ties to Glace Bay because my, my mother and uh, all my aunts and uncles grew up in Glace Bay. Uh -huh. And so it was really cool. Um, but yeah, we ended up doing uh, Operation Projection, so we uh, we transited across uh, on the, the little small Kingston class all the way to West Africa, wow. and we did a multinational exercise, and we did a lot of uh, uh, community uh, relations with some of the communities in there, and uh, we went to some orphanages, and uh, we met with uh, a lot of the members of the community and went to some functions, and we actually uh, got to take part in uh, International Women's Day right. at uh, the Holiday Inn in Sierra Leone, so that was that was really cool wow. to be able to see all the different... Yeah. Uh, all the different leaders and uh, uh, it was a lot very educational and there was a lot of uh, university students uh, stakeholders in Sierra Leone from different businesses that met with the ship right. uh, it was it was a really cool uh, cool experience that's making a difference for yeah, sure it was, right? it, yeah, it was it was really so, good so Donnie when you were there like did people come up and, and they knew obviously you were from the ship did you have like conversations yeah people? absolutely yeah I met so all kinds of people walking in the street did you get to walk in yeah the street? so we walked around a, a little bit obviously some of the areas uh, they're, they're not as safe as some yeah. but you know so we had transportation so we'd go back and forth you know to resorts and different uh, if you want to call it like a hot spot in those areas um, but we did have the opportunity to uh, you know we had a, a soccer game against uh, a local school and we got to go into one of the schools and we read read with some children and got yeah. to meet some really uh, really really cool kids that were very uh, interested in um, like the uh, the North American culture and yeah. uh, our music and everything like that so I had some pretty fun experiences playing some music on my phone for some of the kids and um, uh, yeah so it was it was really cool it was a fantastic awesome. experience you know, Donnie, you're a guy, you've had a pretty interesting journey here. You're doing amazing things on board this Thank ship. You. And you're doing great things for our country, right? Traveling around, spreading the Canadian message. I mean, it's wonderful stuff. What would your piece of advice be to somebody that may be looking at the Navy as a career? Just to, uh, if you're interested, just uh, think about what you do in your, your civilian life or what your educational background is or yeah. what your goals and your, your, your aspirations are for your future. Uh, depending on your age, and a lot of people, um, 
they kind of, you know, they, they, they think they can't join the military based on their, their age. Right. Um, so don't let that deter you. And if you have the... Any officer belong if you If you have the willingness to, to join the military, you know, uh, support your family and, uh, you know, have that pride for your country. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic job. You're going to see the world. You're going to meet some fantastic people. And uh, it's, it's great. It's been, it's been extremely officer rewarding. Today. So, yeah, if, it all depends on what you want to do, where you want to go. Right. And the best thing about the ship uh, and, and shore postings as well, there's so many things that tailor to if you're an engineer, if you have a logistical background, if you maybe used to work in a warehouse, but now you can work on, in a warehouse in the military, you know, right. uh, Army, Navy, Air Force. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and engineering side, combat systems engineering. So there's so many... Uh, positions that people could do uh, right. in the civilian world and then transition into the military and kind of have that that experience so. just a lot of opportunity eh? there's yeah. a lot of opportunity to serve your country whether it is in the navy the army or the air force yep. but i think the navy is pretty cool oh, it's a pretty yeah, absolutely pretty amazing place yeah. well that's a great addition to gale force winds there's no doubt about it uh here you got a guy who's making a difference all the way from cape breton through dartmouth join the navy and making an impact certainly happy to have you on gale force thanks, winds i really appreciate it thanks donnie thank Cheers. you very much Good. All right, well, welcome to another edition of Gale Force Winds. Listen, there's a lot of moving parts on board a Canadian patrol frigate, and some of them aren't all Navy specific. There's Air Force guys on board, and we're certainly excited to talk to a couple of those fellows as well. Ian, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Corporal Ian Bouton. Uh, I'm an ASOP uh, here uh, on the HMCS Toronto. What does ASOP stand for, if you don't mind? That's the uh, Airborne Electronic Sensor Operator. Perfect. Sir. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, I'm attached to the uh, Toronto Hell Air Debt here on the uh, Toronto. Uh, we've been participating in uh, Exercise Cutlass Fury uh, the last uh, couple weeks, and uh, now we're still on site here in St. John's. Uh, had a little nice R&R, &R and then back off on our way to Halifax. Where are you from, Ian? I'm uh, from London, Ontario, originally. All right. Yeah, well. although I had a military family, so I did a lot of moving around growing up uh, i was born just outside of uh, pembroke ontario and then had a few postings with my dad my dad was in the army he's moved around a lot and then i spent most of my time in london so ontario. dad was in the army he was yeah right on and what he was, he was infantry he was infantry okay yeah. and what do you think of you joining the air force uh you know he rose me a little bit for it but uh i saw what the army life was all about uh sort of up close and personal with you know him being an army officer and uh i just knew it's not what i wanted to do particularly right. i've always had a passion for aviation and awesome. flying uh, so it's definitely very drawn to this trade and I love it. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. So you joined the Air Force, now you wind up in the Navy. Yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a weird world we operate in here uh, with the maritime helicopter community. So uh, I don't, there's a common joke that it's the uh, worst trade in the Air Force, but the best uh, job in the Navy. So <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, this must be so amazing to be operating the sensors. A brand new helicopter, right? Yeah, the Cyclones. Uh, very capable aircraft. Uh, I never flew in the Sea Kings. I missed uh, those by a couple of years, but from what I've been told from the guys that were in the Sea Kings that now run the Cyclones, it's a huge upgrade in terms of capabilities, like the sensors. Uh, they're all they're all great, like modern uh, new equipment, and uh, gives us a lot of capabilities that we couldn't have done in the past on the Sea King. So. Ian, tell me this: like, I mean, it is so cool to see a helicopter take off from a ship and land on a ship. What was that first experience like for you? Uh, it's uh, it's a little unnerving at first, for sure, because uh, like in the back, we don't really have any control in that process. It's just right. it's the pilots up front that are guiding us in and coming on down, and you're just putting all your trust and faith that they're that they know what they're doing. And but that's sort of just how we operate. So you have to have sort of your trust and faith in everyone else that they, they know what they're doing. Have um, um, have a sort of like the teamwork there yeah, that right. you know so yeah can you when you're landing can you in your role see you coming closer to the ship or are you into a computer uh, i'm not clear on exactly like what you'd be uh, doing at so that yeah stage. the well, we're actually over the deck we're just sort of strapped in the back but uh there's a few different things that we can do to participate in that process like if there's low visibility and the helicopter can't actually see the ship when we're coming in we can do uh some different um uh, techniques, uh, something called a uh, radar controlled approach, right. where the ship guides the uh, aircraft in uh, to the ship, or uh, us, the ASOPs in the back, we can do uh, a helicopter controlled approach. So we use the radar to guide the, the aircraft in towards the ship. So we're, we have the radar on, we're looking for the paint of the ship on the radar, and then we sort of give vectors to the pilots to steer us in towards the back of the ship. Yeah. And then hopefully, once we get close, they, they come visual and then we can land on. 
It's a lot so. of moving parts to this whole operation to make a ship function and mm -hmm. carry out its duties at sea. I'm sure that you're involved in search and rescue and warfare and all kinds of things. I mean, it must mm -hmm. be an amazing feeling. Yeah, there's, you know, very sort of varied uh, missions that we get tasked for. And, uh, you know, like the Cyclone is primarily like an anti-submarine uh, platform. But yeah, said so given that, it's like, yeah, we're doing a lot of uh, utility work, like using like the rescue hoist or uh, slating cargo with the cargo net. Uh, we have, uh, like we, just, we did a gun shoot here on the exercise. So yeah. we have the C6 uh, general purpose machine gun. We can uh, mount in the door and swing it out to uh, fire. Uh, and then, yeah, just the, sort of surveillance work like flying out doing right. like the recognized uh, maritime service picture uh sort of seeing what ships are in the area or collecting evidence using the eo camera right. or like, just handheld uh, cameras yeah, yeah. taking photos of uh, ships for evidence gathering so all it sorts sounds, of things it sounds yeah. like an amazing occupation i mean it, it sounds like you're you're challenged with a lot of things everything from operating machine guns the computer systems command control systems mm -hmm. piecing all that together and handing that information back to the ship to make decisions definitely uh, it's uh sort of like a very like uh, jack of all trades master of none sort of uh, situation being an ace off on the cyclones here uh respected to like be responsible for like acoustics and the radar wow. uh the yeah, esm systems eo all the utility work like the machine gunning the hoisting all that uh so yeah it's a lot of different sort of skill sets we have yeah. to have in order Sounds like a great occupation. Sounds like you're having a great bit of fun doing it. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. what would you tell somebody that's looking at maybe the Air Force, Navy as, a, as an occupation? Uh, I've had nothing but glowing things to say about the Air Force. It's, uh, you know, it's a great career, uh, lost chance for personal development, uh, travel. I've been all over, all over across Canada from coast to coast, even up north in the high Arctic for survival training. So uh, if you want to see Canada, if you want to see the world, if you want to uh, test yourself and uh, work with like, you know, the newest uh, sort of generations of technology that are coming out today, uh, the Air Force, especially the ASOP trade is a great way to do I mean, it. You're what, still in your early 20s? Uh, I'm 33. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I look, look a little younger than he looks yeah. young, Jerry. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess standing next to Alan. Alan is 55 today, by the way. So you look a lot younger. <laughs> yeah. He uh, listened. Just want to say that you know, standing here talking to you is, is amazing, and, and having this incredible machine behind us is yeah. awe-inspiring, Alan. No, it absolutely is, Jerry. I mean, as I said at the beginning, it takes a lot of parts, right, to make a ship move, and and a lot of occupations that feed into the to the the operation of a ship. But it comes down to the people, Ian. And I got to tell you, it's kind of great getting to know you, man. I'm glad that you decided to join. I'm glad you followed in Dad's footsteps in the military career. I'm glad you decided to join the Air Force, and I sure am happy that you're on board this ship today to tell us a little bit about your story. We certainly appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been a great yeah. opportunity. Great, yeah. hey, thanks, yeah. Ian. Cheers. Great. Thanks. Yeah. All right, well, welcome to another uh, great edition of Gale Force Winds. Uh, here we are on board HMCS Toronto. We got the privilege now to talk to the uh, the air, uh, air debt commander, I guess? Uh, the wing commander for 12 wing Shearwater. Yeah. Wing commander for 12 wing Shearwater, and I guess controlling both coasts, both in Halifax and Esquimalt. We're certainly excited to have a conversation because there's a lot of moving parts on board this ship, and the air crew makes up a big part of that. Patrick, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm a uh, AXO, Airborne uh, uh, Combat Systems Officer. Uh, we were, used to be referred to as a navigator. I've uh, been in the Air Force now for 30 years. Uh, both coasts, flown uh, with operational squadrons both coasts. Uh, this is my third uh, uh, command appointment within uh, 12 Wing. Uh, and uh, I'm super proud to be here, uh, working with uh, the teams uh, here on both coasts uh, and getting these uh, cyclones to sea and uh, supporting the Navy. Where are you from originally, Patrick? I'm from uh, Ottawa. Okay. Yeah. So you, uh, from Ottawa, you decided the Air Force is your path. Yeah, actually, uh, my father was uh, was in the Air Force as well as a engineering officer. Okay. And uh, so I traveled around a bit as a kid, uh, different bases, and uh, really sort of uh, got to love the Air Force and uh, joined up uh, and uh, selected Air Force for my yeah. uh, for my uh, element. Well, it's a pretty amazing career. It sounds like you've had, and we had the pleasure of talking to some of the the team that work with you, and they're amazing people. Right? Young they people are. engaged, yeah. uh, and you've got brand new equipment. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, uh, so I, I spent my entire career with the Sea King, uh, and just coming into this job now, it's my first uh, taste of the 21st century spaceship that we call the Cyclone. Right. Uh, it, it's a massive leap forward in technology uh, and in, uh, in capability as well. Uh, but it also comes with an extra level of complexity. Right. And so uh, a bit of a leap uh, between the old analog Sea King and this aircraft in terms of 
uh, training both for the air crew as well as uh, as for the technicians in get, keeping it flying and keeping it going. So, and it's such a vital piece of equipment for the ship. I mean, it adds so much to it. Absolutely. It's. Uh, I was just having a conversation with uh, the wing chief foreign officer, and we're talking exactly about that this morning on the flight deck about how much of a uh, force multiplier helicopter is for the Navy. Um, they probably wouldn't like me to say it, but it's, uh, it's probably one of the primary weapon systems if you have one on board. It's yeah. uh, the utility of this aircraft to be able to, to look out uh, and uh, have the ship have an ability to understand the threats well away from, uh, from danger zones, uh, to be able to deliver things and people back and forth between shore and other ships, yeah. uh, and as well uh, in all aspects of warfare like ASW and uh, anti-service warfare. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing force, uh, force multiplier for, for the ship. Now, Patrick, you, uh, you've been in and around the Navy a long time. Tell me about that relationship between the Air Force and the Navy on a ship like this. Uh, it's absolutely vital. And right. uh, it's, you can actually see it when you go on a long deployment. You know, the Air, de Air Department uh, joins the ship, and you can see that co cohesive sort of uh, uh, teamwork start to build in the first couple of weeks until uh, they become part of the, of, the, of the crew and part of the whole team on the ship. Uh, and it's a uh, it, it's a big family, and, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's a uh, it's it's a little bit tough leaving the ship as an air detachment and going back ashore, and then being assigned to a different ship at a later time. Uh, you make some great friendships, and uh, and like I said, you you cohesively gel with the, with the ship on a deployment, and really work as a as a single machine. Right. Uh, and it's a it's a vital relationship that uh, that we always uh, enjoy, and we foster whenever we can. So. Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, to, to watch the Air Force and the Navy work hand in glove on these missions. It's a really exciting time in the defense sector right now, Patrick. Exactly. There's a lot of cool things happening, and Canada as well. Uh, it must be really fun to be in amongst all this in the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, um, uh, I did my, uh, my uh, undergraduate degree in engineering, yeah. and uh, so the technology with respect to uh, this new aircraft and uh, how we integrate these, these ships uh, and helicopters is uh, not necessarily a passion, but something I find very, very interesting. Uh, I was actually the commanding officer of HOTEF, uh, which is our helicopter test and evaluation facility, right. which uh, we built all the test plans and did all the acceptance of Cyclone, uh, as well as uh, supporting the operational test and evaluation of the integration of the helicopters uh, to the ships uh, when we first got them. So It's interesting, Alan, you know, we talk a lot about academia and how right. uh, the inter interplay between academia. What university did you go to, Patrick? I actually went to the, I started at uh, University of Ottawa. And I went to Royal Roads Military College uh -huh. and then the Royal very Military College. We're yeah, both very flag, familiar so. with it, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Jerry stole a flag from Royal Roads <laughs> back in the 80s, just so you know. Uh, know We're not supposed people. to get into yeah. those stories, <laughs> Alan. Uh, so. That's another yeah. podcast that we won't talk about. Yeah. Patrick, you've had an amazing journey and you've worked with some great people. We've met some of them here today. Tell us a little bit, uh, what would your piece of advice be to somebody that might be looking at the military as an occupation? Uh, Wow, it's, uh, it's an adventure. Right. Uh, if you want to see the world, uh, you want to get some amazing skills and understanding uh, of how, uh, uh, how components and mechanics work uh, and, and some skills that will help you in your life depending whether you stay in the military or not, uh, it's a great opportunity. From my perspective, uh, I've learned a heck of a lot, had some amazing experiences throughout my career, um, and uh, just always keep a positive attitude and uh, never... Uh, Never, uh, never pass up an open door uh, in, in your uh, in your journey in the military, and uh, you'll accomplish and see amazing things. So. Yeah, and that's, that's a, amazing, isn't it, Alan? You know, I'm thinking, Patrick, as you're talking, for a guy with 30 years in, at the age of 35, you look fantastic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's the time at sea, actually. That's, uh, that's, that's yeah. I, I love that you say never pass an open door, and that's such a yeah. great piece of advice, right? Yeah. In life, for somebody in the military or not. Just you see the opportunity and everything and give it a try, right? Oh, yes. Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for taking the time out to speak with us. I know you're a busy guy. you got a lot of moving parts here. you got a lot of good people working for you. We certainly appreciate you taking time out to talk to Gale Force Wednesday. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, Thank cheers. you, Patrick. Right. Thank thanks, you. Man. Yeah, right. appreciate it. Well, this is an interesting edition of Gale Force Winds. We're on board HMCS Toronto, but we're actually in the cockpit of a Cyclone helicopter. We get to meet one of the pilots that operates this incredible piece of machinery and supports the operation of the ship, supports the, uh, basically, supports the operation of the Navy and indeed our country. So, Tom, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Captain Tom Graham. I've been in the Air Force now for 14 years. I enrolled back in 07. Uh, I wrote pilot on the sheet and nothing else because that's what I wanted to be. So uh, I came in, I, I managed to do that. I had already done my degree. I was in uh, teacher's college at the time and just decided to shift gears and wanted to 
I wanted to do this, so that's uh, a big shift. That's a big <laughs> shift. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was I was just in a. It was honestly I was in an English class. I was doing a summer course to finish early, and I just like leaned back in my chair, looking at a window. Is the uh, poetry in the Romantic period was the course, and I just like watched a plane fly over, and I just had that moment where you realize that life's just choices, and you see you see that plane go by, and you're like, someone's flying it. They wanted to do that. They made that choice. And so I just decided that's what I wanted to do. So I walked that afternoon right up to the recruiting center and started. Uh, <laughs> where, where was this? Where, in Fredericton. Where, you were in Fredericton. I was at UNB in Fredericton. You were in UNB in a poetry class, saw yeah. a plane, and you said, this that's is it. it. Yeah, I'd always wanted to be a pilot. My grandfather, he was a pilot in the Second World War. And then that's the only real military in my family. But he, uh, yeah, he was in the Dutch military. And he became a colonel, a base commander, and then the attache to Canada. And that's how they end, my mom ended up over here with him through that. Wow. And then... Uh, from there, I just just eventually decided that it was worth it. Like I always wanted it, and then you just sort of you just kind of pick other things, right. and then eventually you sort of realize that life's just a choice, right? So, wow, um, <laughs> what a great start to this story, <laughs> Tom. So you write down pilot and nothing else. Nothing else, and you yeah. Go through the recruiting process. And they, they make you write three things, and I just wrote it three times. That was it. Like I'm, I'm not here for a job. I'm here for this job, right? So wow, uh, it was a long road. I had my degree, so it should have been quick. But I was I was almost seven years. I got hurt a couple times. Yeah. You have some time to kill, so you buy a motorcycle, and right. like everyone else, I crashed it. So okay. that was that was a while and few incidents along the way but uh so how long did it take you to get your wings after that it was full seven i was i got my wings in i maybe six i guess 2000 end of 2013 yeah and then 2014 they sent me to shearwater so man you didn't give us no it was five years before i did my first course is that right yeah it was a long it was a long road but it was good i, I kept busy the whole time they they give you good jobs right and tell me this what was it like when you got your wings oh man it's just relief i don't, I don't know how it's uh flight training is it's, it's mostly it's almost like you're doing a driving test every day for like each course is probably about 80 trips right so it's just 80 driving tests and it's just that every day there's someone sitting next to you and you just learn that you learn to take criticism you learn to let that roll off your back and understand that everyone's just trying to make you better right um, but then it's just all of that work it culminates and then you finally get to do a trip where at the end of it it's not about you and what you did it's just about what the crew did right and that's what you work towards so it's just relief like the my wife we'd had we had our first daughter while I was still in training. Yeah. So that was a lot of stress. And uh, you just like, I think everyone was just relieved. Like there's, you don't have job security until you have your wings, obviously. Right. So just so much happiness. Tom, when you got your wings and the first time you take flight and you know, this is you now. Yeah. You're the guy. What's that feel like? Oh man, a little scary. Yeah. The first, especially like once you start, you finish. Like I remember, so I went and did the Sea King OTU, we call them just the course that qualified you on the Sea King. And you finish that and you're still flying next to an aircraft captain like he's right. still calling the shots and sorting everything out but then eventually you upgrade yeah. and that first time that you sign for it and stick next to a guy and it's just it's you it's that's that's all that's left so it uh it's intimidating and then you do it and you just you feel confident though the military always kind of like pushes you right. uh, your first solo is on your eighth flight or some such like right so they're always pushing you faster than you think you should be pushed yeah but that's the system and but it be ready this is a complex aircraft <laughs> yeah. and you're landing on a moving platform in the middle of the ocean and the way and the places these ships operate i mean just off the coast of newfoundland here it's not the most hospitable place <laughs> no right i mean that has got to be scary stuff it's uh you know, i had uh it's mentoring right you just, you just meet people that have been there and done that and then their their ability to just like calmly explain how to do it and like i'll never forget it was uh, my first time it was uh Brad Kavanaugh was the pilot that I was with, and I landed, it was on a, a Romanian ship. Right. But I asked him, he just like landed, he's like, do you want to do one? I was like, I've never landed on a ship. He's like, you just keep going down, you'll hit it. Like, and that's really <laughs> all there is, right? So there's there's the cues that we use and things that guide you. And I mean, the hangar face is right right there in front of you. So it's 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 definitely intimidating. And, and for the first while, it's, it's hard to get over, but then it just becomes like anything else. Somehow it becomes normalized and it just, you just sort of put it in the deck. <laughs> I'm amazed at how, <laughs> easy you describe that you just keep coming down <laughs> till you hit it but i mean that's really complex stuff and it's amazing but i love the way that you know i mean basically they train you for it you can do it just if there's people out there that are looking at this as an occupation i mean the navy or the air force prepares you for this stuff, oh definitely right? yeah yeah it's yeah. it's all it's all built it's all built to get you where where we're at here that's their whole goal so it's training is hard it's it's fast they they give you very little time to accomplish what you need to accomplish but they that is to make sure that you can learn on that curve and just keep going so yeah. it, and it just never stops and when you're done course you don't stop you're still like they say i finished the sea king and all of a sudden i had to learn this thing so you're jumping out of one machine that was built in the 50s and 
hopping into this. Yeah. So it's a big learning curve, and you. But that's that's sort of how you've been trained all along. So you just sort of keep rolling with it. And then you, and then you know, you're spending time with the navy. That's complex too. Yeah. Living on a <laughs> ship is, you know, I mean, that's probably not what you had in your mind when you thought you'd be a pilot. It was the last. I I did my uh, my waiting in Halifax. I waited. I worked at the rescue center. And that was the one thing I knew I didn't want to do was fly Sea King. That was the one definite, right. like, whatever I do, I don't want to do that. Like, And then yeah. I just did a tour of a ship, and it just, it, it seemed exciting. Is that right? And then I went and did uh, all my training, and I realized I could stay in Halifax, and the boat seemed exciting. It's Besides besides being away from home, it's being on the boat is, is the best operation you can do. It's, it's it's fun. It's very focused. You have, like, a good group. You get to know all your technicians really well, right. which is sure you don't always get. So you become such a strong, closely knit team. Yeah. You just learn so much more, you get closer with everybody, and you you get to fly every day. Like ashore, it's not quite as simple. Right. Or it's not. It's way more complicated. So it's more simple here. Yeah. But you're not at home, so that's the right. The that's, cost benefit that you right. balance. And the team. Tell me a bit about that. I mean, because you get to know everybody, right? I mean, oh, you're yeah. living and eating, and you're yeah. you're at, you're at this together. It must be a great feeling for those teams to gel. That's it. You you always come out and you're just learning everyone's name because ashore, like I say, yeah, they have their kind of their spaces they work in. We have ours, and, and they're very. They're very separate, not by like design, but just like that's just how it works. Yeah. So you come out here, and th this is how you build the relationships. And then you go back ashore, and that's how you get things done. Is now you know the technicians, you know who to go talk to, and you get those answers, and it helps you just keep going. And like, and you see all the senior people; they always have the technicians they talk to, and they can refer to. And like, when you have a question, we we know what we know about the aircraft, but they know so much more than we do right. that often you just end up in that problem where you're like, oh, I really don't know what this is. Like, I'll go, you know, I'll go see Alex, or right. I'll go see someone, and he'll. He'll sort me out. Like he'll he'll kind of delve into it a bit deeper, and they, they know deeper into the systems than we do often. Right. So. Tom, sounds like you've had a pretty <laughs> pretty cool <laughs> journey so far, and I, you're really in the middle of it, right? I mean, you're yeah. you got a long career ahead of you, and I really like the way that you just said, like you can anybody can kind of do this, right? You just right. put your mind to it, and you can do it. What would a piece of advice be that you would give somebody that might be looking at this, saying, I don't know if I can do that or not? Just be honest with yourself. If it's what you want, be honest with yourself. Don't. Don't deny it. If it's not, don't do it. It's yeah. it's a hard it's a hard road that like it's it costs a lot in terms of like it's hard on families. It's hard on like there's a lot of challenges. It comes with a lot of benefits. Like the it's also very good in a lot of ways. So like I think the key is just to really be honest with yourself about what you want. Like think about it, and then uh, if it is though, go for it. Like right. it's all these dreams are achievable. So yeah, Tom, I can tell you that I am sure glad that that professor uh, UNB <laughs> in the poetry class didn't inspire you that day and that uh, you chose this oh. as an occupation. I think we're better because you're a part of it. And uh, it's really neat to understand the complexities of the Air Force relationship with the Navy. And we spoke to some of your team and it's just fantastic. But getting to meet you and just how easily you explain what it is that you do on here, it's been a real, uh, it's been a real good conversation. It's so thanks pleasure. very much for joining Gale Force Winds and Thanks for doing what you do for Canada. Pleasure, thank you. Cheers. Good. Right. Well, listen, another great edition of Gale Force Winds. We're on board HMCS Toronto, uh, talking to some of the guys that make the aircraft go. Now, we've had the pleasure to speak to some of the pilots. We spoke to the uh, squadron commanders, spoke to some of the navigators on board. But these guys actually make the aircraft function, both inside and out. And I'm very excited to get to know exactly who they are and what they do. So uh, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Master Corporal Michael Blanus. I am an avionics systems technologist uh, right now aboard HMCS Toronto, uh, more often on at, on land at 423 Squadron. Uh, where are you from originally? Uh, originally born in Salisbury, New Brunswick, uh, but grew up uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, yeah. Right on. How about you? Uh, I'm Master Corporal Alex Niccolo. Um, I am an aviation systems technician on the Cyclone. Uh, I was born in Windsor, Ontario, but I spent the majority of my life growing up in Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia, a half hour outside Halifax. All right, we got to unpack some of this, guys. Why'd you move around here? Uh, my my father worked for uh, Digital Then Compact and HP, and they moved him around as companies were being bought around. So okay, yeah, right that's on. how I ended up in Halifax. Right on. Uh, my dad, when I was growing up, he did a lot of retail with Kmart and then bargain shop and whatnot. So he would get moved around doing management <laughs> things. So all right, kind of like a posting, but not a real posting. Yeah. 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 So you guys had like a similar up. Very you're right. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, <laughs> yeah. and you also have some similarities in how you kind of got involved in the military. That's right. Yeah, uh, we both started as uh, air cadets way back when. Uh, once we entered the air cadet program, we both joined as uh, air officers, so CIC officers with the Air Force, uh, training cadets. Uh, I did it for two and a half years. I think you did it for a little longer. I did it I did. for uh, two years, actually. Yeah. Right on. Okay. And then from there, we both switched over to the Reg Force. 
So that cadet program must have meant a great deal to you to oh, go all the way through absolutely. and then become officers. Tell me about what it meant to you. Uh, for me, it was it was uh, just an introduction to what became my career. It, it gave me a, a window to see what it is I wanted to do. Uh, and I've never looked back on it. So it, it gives you opportunities to uh, pursue you know, flying if you want to be a glider pilot or uh, if you want to be a full blood pilot, uh, if you want to do survival training, if you want to do, there's, there's any number of options you can right. do with it. If you want to follow music, the same opportunities there for you. So it's a great program. Well, you. Yeah. So when I, how I got in cadets was through my dad. He was a cadet back in Glace Bay when he was growing up and he was always pushing on, on me. Um, it wasn't until just before my 14th birthday in that November, because uh, in Kinetsu Joint at 12, that I, I gave it a, what the heck, let's give it a try. It's free, might as well go, mm. and hooked me. I didn't really have any guidance when I was a teenager. I wasn't a sports guy. I was just kind of lost, but it gave me um, a ton of confidence. I became a, a survival instructor. I uh, did a rifle coach instructor's course. Yep. Um, I became, I ended up as the uh, chief foreman of the squadron uh, in 652 in Milford. Uh, and then I want to continue on for a little bit because I still wasn't sure what my future was going to be So I decided to contribute by helping them out by being an officer um, Got the confidence and the experience I needed to apply to the reg force and I did did the switch But I'm still with the cadet program now. So I've been since day one. I've been with the cadets for 21 years Wow, yeah. I mean you yeah. guys are being in the, involved in the Air Force since you were young boys. Uh, 17 years for me, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, you talk about confidence. Mm -hmm. You said you needed to get the confidence. you got to have some real confidence to work on this piece of equipment behind me. Oh, yeah. It's uh, yeah. an intimidating thing, for sure. I bet it is. Yeah. So, okay, now, we need to break down the division of kind of your responsibilities, what you do on this aircraft. So, why don't we go ahead and start with you. Okay, so for me, uh, as an avionics system technologist, or technician, rather, uh, more or less anything electronic on the aircraft becomes my responsibility and there's there's some overlap between myself and weapons techs on the aircraft but we we tend to help them out a lot with their electronic systems too so anything with a wire or electrons is more or less my responsibility okay so jerry and i were just in there there's a lot of wires around it there's in one there. or two for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a complex machine it is a very complicated machine it's one of the most complicated it's uh, i believe either the first or very nearly the first fully uh, fly-by-wire helicopter in existence. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And how about yours? Uh, so my responsibilities on this beast is mostly mechanical, uh, hydraulics, uh, some pneumatics, very basic electrical because everything kind of plugs into <laughs> each other, um, fuel, but yeah, mechanical is usually the big one, anything from the rotors to the engines and the landing gear and everything in between. You know, I uh, we spoke to a pilot earlier there, Tom, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how much the team meant in that gel. I can understand why. I mean, he can't take off no, without it, being it, confident that you two guys have this thing ready to go. It's a very unique uh, look on the military because it's the way we do our day to day is different than the standard. You know, you have your officers and you have your NCM sort of military mentality. For us, it's very much a team approach. It's the pilots are giving us information as technicians, and we're we're fixing the systems and telling them, hey, this is what's you know going on. And it's a back and forth communication more than it is a one way talk. Um, to go along with our normal duties, though, on the ship, to make it even crazier, is on the deck. It, it's up to us and our team. We're the deck handlers. So while the pilots are out on the deck, getting this thing ready to take off, we're out there walking around, getting fuel, making sure the chocks are out, that it's all prepped and ready to take off. So ensuring while safety. they're ensuring safety, that's the biggest, <laughs> the biggest thing. One. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. So while the pilots and the air crew are inside getting ready to take off, we're out there on no matter the weather, um, making sure it is ready to take off and the and they get the green light. As well as all the deck evolutions we do over the back, of the deck there and the front. Yeah. Uh, we are the deck directors. <laughs> Close out, Port Watch. Special security event, cable party. Cast to station for the departure of St. John's Harbor. Just the upper deck, naval combat address. Assume damage control condition yanking. So, sound of that, we're going to go to sea. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say it all again. <laughs> Close out, Port Watch. Flashbacks for Special you, Al. Hmm? Yeah, flashbacks. Cast to station for the departure of St. John's Harbor. Dress on the upper deck, naval combat address. Assume damage control condition yanking. Okay, so that pipe couldn't have been more perfect for the podcast. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it means to be a part of the Navy for two Air Force guys. <laughs> it's, a, it's a unique challenge to have to learn how to, to do everything you do in the Air Force, you know, as an airman and then again as a technician, and then have to learn all the, the tasks you have to do with the Navy as well. So before we go on a ship, we have to take the Naval Environmental Training just to become familiar with how the Navy does their job as well. 
Uh, to me, to go along with Mike said, uh, what Mike said, it's also um, huge heritage. So the, the reason why we on the boat exist is uh, prior unification back in the 60s, the, the Navy had its own air wing. The Navy controlled the Sea Kings, and then amalgamation happened, and the Air Force took over all flying assets. So we have a, a huge heritage connected to our life that a lot of the Air Force doesn't. Um, but yeah, as a naval aid, aviator, it's, um, it's a weird world. We joined the Air Force not expecting to be and brothers with the Navy, <laughs> and here we are. We're doing something that most people are in our world will never experience. Right. It's pretty unique. It's pretty special, I bet. Mm. Yeah. Very much so. Guys, I got to tell you, it's been a great conversation with the both of you. Uh, your ability to make this, as you were call it, beast <laughs> function is really quite impressive. And uh, thanks for what you do for the Navy. Thanks for what you do for the Air Force. Thanks for what you do for Canada. I'm sure glad that the cadet organization hooked mm. you and then you find your way into the Air Force. So thanks, guys. Appreciate no problem. It. Thanks for the time. Uh, what a pleasure it is for our next guest to be on board the show. We're standing on board the bridge wing of HMCS Toronto in historic St. John's. The entire fleet was in uh, over the weekend. And, and I have to tell you, it was impressive to see so many Canadians walking around the streets of St. John's, enjoying themselves, and quite frankly, telling the story of the Canadian Navy. And it was a real pleasure. But this is a real pleasure we have right now. We've got the fleet commander for the East Coast Navy with us, uh, Commodore Chris. Robinson and what a play, what a, what a title that is right out of the gate fleet commander you got to be happy with that title alone Chris why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself hey uh, first thanks for interviewing me uh, second uh, just a quick shout out to St. John's it's been super awesome to be here we're uh, we're parked right downtown uh, so when we came in on Friday like it was a non-stop parade of cars going up and down Many it's, of them the same while, cars, right? honking horns and waving, and you know the reception here has been been really awesome. Uh, the sailors have had a good time, uh, and it's been too long since we've been back to St. John's. St. John's is sort of a, a cultural home for the uh, for the Navy, you know, the connection to the crow's nest and all that kind of stuff. So it's been really, really great to be here. So as for myself, uh, I'm a career naval officer who uh, enrolled in the service out of a small town in western Quebec called Hudson. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Uh, and I joined the Navy uh, to see the world and uh, pretty much have done that ever since so it's been really awesome. What kind of farm Chris? A dairy farm. Was that right? Uh, so we had Jersey cows um, but uh, we, we had a sort of a mix of everything so we had a donkey and we had six horses and a couple hundred chickens and pigs and we even had two ge uh, you know a geese and a gander. Uh, but yeah, it was primarily a dairy farm. Uh, you know it's a it's a bit of a stretch to go from a dairy farm to commanding submarines, to commanding an entire fleet. Tell me about that journey. So, you know, one of the things about dairy farms that, uh, that you learn very young is that there's always work to do. Uh, and uh, so shift work, uh, I would suppose, came naturally to me because, uh, you know, the, the cows need to be milked twice a day. It doesn't really matter what day of the year it is or what day of the week it is. Uh, and, you know, that's not uh, dissimilar from, from how ships and submarines uh, operate. Uh, and and this, the teamwork, the small teams, all that kind of stuff is is in keeping with many small and medium enterprises uh, out there. So, yeah. It, um, this couldn't be a better Canadian story. Canadian dairy farmer turned submarine captain, fleet commander. That's fantastic. Tell me about what drew you to submarine service. So, uh, funny story. Um, I grew up uh, and I'm relatively good at math. Small talents, and that's mine. Um, so I was uh, I was going through the SAGEP system, and I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be an engineer or an accountant. And uh, my initials are CA, and at the time, accountants in Canada were CAs. Right. Yeah. So I thought, I, ah, CA Robinson, CA. It's pretty much like a sign of some right. kind. Yeah. It's meant to be. So I studied business. <laughs> yeah. uh, I actually met my wife uh, in first year accounting class. Uh, so, you know, some, some benefits from having uh, gone down that stream. But uh, I kind of, you know, by nature, I'm more um, uh, excitement oriented. It probably sounds very pejorative. My sister in law is an accountant. I have nothing but respect for accountants. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I like uh, change of pace and variety. I like uh, interacting with people. I like doing things. Um, the small boy in me likes being associated with machinery. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, for all of those reasons, um, 
uh, career in the Navy sort of appealed to me. And how I ended up in submarines is I saw Das Boot. Okay. And uh, thought it was a super amazing uh, uh, life experience for the people on board, notwithstanding the unhappy ending for the crew. Um, but uh, yeah, so that kind of inspired me a little bit. Um, there was a, uh, an Iroquois class ship that had visited Montreal when I was young, and I'd done a, a ship tour. Um, so I had you know, some interest uh, in, in a marine life. Uh, I was a, uh, a small dinghy sailor. Um, so yeah, all that sort of conspired that uh, when I graduated university, I joined the Navy. Listen, that's fantastic. You, you made a mention there that you like being around people and you liked interacting with people. Your job right now is fleet commander. You got a lot of sailors working for you. I, I do, but uh, you know, it, it fundamentally the Navy is a human enterprise, uh, and everything we do is about people. Uh, and what the product you know that we deliver, if you will, is trained sailors. Uh, it, it's it's not about the ships. It's not about the aircraft. Uh, it's not about the um, the operational output at the fleet command level. It's about uh, sailors. Uh, and, you know that that appeals to me. Yeah, well, you got a great group of people here. We've had the pleasure yeah. to talk to a lot of them. You've got to be incredibly proud of them. Oh, I am. And, you know, the, the last couple of weeks we were out, we, you know, the task group was at sea. So you know, a lot of hard work uh, for everyone to get the ships out to sea. Um, but uh, going around, watching people learn things for the first time. Um, the, for many of the, the sailors and the junior officers on board, it was, it was the first time they've sailed with more than one ship. Uh, and it's, it's such a different experience. I mean... The, the analogy I, I was using with my family to explain it is, you know, when, when you take your car and you go to the grocery store, it's a pretty simple evolution to drive there. But if, you know, you and a couple of friends decide to each take your car, suddenly you're coordinating, okay, where are we going to meet? Who's going to be in the front? Who's going to be in the back? What gas station? <laughs> what all what that kind of analogy. Stuff, you know, and, and that's what it's like at sea with the ships. Right. Um, everything from doing the shoulder check before you turn left. Right. Um, we do that here. Yeah. Um, and you don't. You don't get that experience unless you're operating with you know with multiple ships 100 percent, and such professional crew i mean you can tell yeah. they're proud of what they do and they're making a big difference there's absolutely yeah, no absolutely. doubt about it but, uh, chris it's an ex go ahead no i was gonna say you know it's one of the reasons we're here in st john's is uh you know it, it's a bit of a reward for the crew for the you know really for the outstanding work they've done the professionalism the performance on cutlass fury um that we're back, we're, we're in a port, uh, we were here long enough. So, I mean, something people may not appreciate is we don't just park the ships and sort of turn them off and leave. There's always people working on board around the clock. So we, we were in St. John's for four days so that everyone could get at least two days uh, in the city. Um, and that's, you know, sort of kudos yeah. for all the hard work they did. That's the first time they've been ashore in quite a while, is it It not? is. Uh, and there, there are of COVID, I guess. Exactly. Right? There, there are people, uh, on the ships that have never been to a port visit in their naval careers, you know, wow. and some of them have been in two, two, three right. years. Um, yeah. It's just COVID has changed a lot, um, and it, it, you know, that has detracted from the sailors' experience. Yeah. Um, like part of joining the navy and seeing the world is not just seeing waves, like right. you know, going to ports and, yeah. and seeing, you know, the all the local attractions and, and the local people. Well, I tell you, for the first port, for many of them, you couldn't have picked a better one. No, no, it's uh, certainly, you know, when I when I started in the East Coast Navy, um, my first port visit was St. Yeah. John's. It was a memorable uh, port visit. Uh, and I, I hope that that was the same experience. Chris, it's been, my, it's been my port visit for 55 <laughs> years. <so laughs> I decided not to leave. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, St. John's an awesome place to go. Right. It, uh, Chris, I mean, it's a very exciting time for the Canadian Navy right now. You've got new ships being built as we speak. Yeah. You've got more ships on the horizon, capabilities the likes of which we don't even completely understand. Well, maybe you do, but we don't completely <laughs> understand uh, what it's going to be like. For a young person joining the Navy now, it's got to be an exciting time. Well, that's, you know, uh, that's what I would say. And then, you know, people will be looking at me going, ah, oh, it's another old person saying, oh, great time to join the Navy, which, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I could be in your shoes, but like it truly is. Yeah. Um, we have uh, in Halifax, we have the second of the Arctic and offshore patrol vessels alongside preparing to go out uh, later this year for sea trials. The first of those is uh, in the north right now. She's uh, just gone through the Northwest Passage. Uh, and you know, I, th I think of the people on, on that first ship, Harry DeWolf, 
Now, what a life experience that right. is going to be. They they left Halifax in July. They went up, you know, did a little bit of ice breaking, did a little bit of community outreach. They went to little uh, harbors and inlets that most Canadians have never heard of, let alone uh, visit. Uh, and then they're going to come through the other side, uh, go down all the way down to the Panama Canal. Right. Through the canal. Like, it's just one deployment, Caribbean and Arctic. Um, Unbelievable. Unbelievable experience. And working on a high tech, very comfortable ship, very capable ship. Uh, I mean, it does more than uh, than break through ice. It's it's an offshore patrol vessel. It has a command management system on. It has sensors. It has a gun. Um, all those things that, that bring effect to the, the government of Canada. Um, and it's it's a comfortable ship. Uh, yeah. You know, people uh, instead of mess decks of eighteen people, you know, the worst on board is uh, six right. in a cabin. Uh, most are in four or two uh, person cabins. So. Pretty good uh, life. It's a pretty good life. And, <laughs> you know, the different, new, different than a submarine. It's very different than a submarine. <laughs> um, but you know, the new tankers are coming as well. I, I follow on uh, on social media the uh, construction progress of um, HMCS Protector uh, in the C-SPAN yard in Vancouver, and that's going to be another very high tech ship, very capable, uh, dual redundancy on almost every system. It, it's going to be an amazing capability when it joins the fleet in a couple of years. So, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty good job to yeah, join the uh, Navy. A hundred percent. New ships coming. Yeah. Really great people involved. Teamwork, professional people involved, and solid leadership. And you're a big part of that. Well, I, I try to be. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to take words from you. Know what? <laughs> but <laughs> solid Humility leadership is part of leadership. leadership. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, but there, I mean, there is solid leadership. Like I'm not going to take the credit at the senior level. Uh, but I, I think as you walk through the ship, um, right from you know sailor second class on up, there is solid leadership uh, in the fleet, in the Navy, in the Armed Forces, uh, in the department. Uh, we have uh, embarked with us uh, for this uh, sail back to Halifax, uh, a bunch of uh, public servants uh, out of uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister uh, Policy uh, Shop, uh, particularly the people that deal with external facing relations. Um, and they're just great. Uh, I say young Canadians because you know at my age everyone is young uh, <laughs> but you know great face of the public service enthusiastic demonstrating leadership in their files and it's the same thing with the sailors on board they're you know you have the sailor first class that's uh, running a small team when we depart here you know handling lines uh, landing the brow all that kind of really basic seamanship skills what you need is someone to take charge and get things done uh, and yeah no I'm thrilled with the leadership on board Oh, that's fantastic. I got to tell you, Chris, I sure am glad that Iroquois class made a port visit in Quebec and that you were <laughs> able to go down and see it. I'm yeah. glad that you watched Daz Boot and Thank were you. inspired, and I sure am glad you joined the Canadian Navy to provide leadership to this amazing task force and this amazing Navy that we have. Real pleasure to have Commodore Chris Robinson on Gale Force Winds here today. What an absolute pleasure. Yes, and you know, I'd just like to add, Chris, thank you for bringing the fleet here. I have two young boys. As a spokesperson for this community, I think we really get inspired as a community to see Canada's naval presence. And and more of it, I think, would be great. So if I can influence in any way, <laughs> have uh, something like this more often, that would be great. Uh, um, <laughs> pandemic, pandemic permitting, we will be back yeah. more frequently. Perfect. Great. You know, here we are on board HMCS Toronto on the bridge. A lot of great scenery around us. There's a lot of moving parts to a uh, military platform, particularly a destroyer. We had the opportunity to talk to some sailors, some aircraft crew, and all of those moving parts have to come together. But there's one very important part in the Navy, and that is the weather. And somebody has to predict the weather all the time. And it can't be like the things you see on the news. It's got to be a lot more accurate than that. So on board the ship, they have their own meteorological technicians. And we have the pleasure to have one on Gale Force Winds with us right now. Pascal, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Pascal Remiard. I'm from a little bit all over the place. My parents are military, so I've lived in the lifestyle growing up. And right now I'm posted to Halifax on the Toronto. Tell me this, what did mom and dad do in the military? Uh, mom was a driver and my dad was an avian tech, so he did the mechanics on F-18s. So what, where did you travel when you were young? Uh, I was born in New Brunswick, went to Ottawa, 
Comox, Baggettville, and then from Baggettville I joined the forces and went to Gagetown, Baggettville, Cold Lake, and now I just got to wow. Halifax. So you've been all over the place. Now a Absolutely. lot of those places sound like Air Force bases. They have been, yes. So how did you find yourself in the Navy? It was a uh, rock, paper, rank, and I did not win. <laughs> <laughs> they needed somebody on ship and out of three uh, med techs that were our sergeants, I was the only one that hadn't had any time on sea. Right. And so. do you like it? A lot better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, yeah, so far I like it. And what's your favorite part about being in the Navy? It's got to be the teamwork. <laughs> uh, so far it's uh, the one part that I've gotten to do. So right. here in St. John's. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Tell me exactly what you do on board. Like what does a meteorolo meteorological technician do? Uh, that all kind of depends on what we've got. So if it's just the ship, no air debt, it's pretty much just uh, briefing the daily weather, letting everybody know, okay, what sea states we're expecting, uh, the winds for the courses and stuff like that. When there's a air debt on board, so when the chopper's here, it's hourly observations with uh, creating a METAR, uh, not a METAR, a TAF, Right. So that's a uh, forecast. Okay. So depending on where we are, I pick, find a point of where they're flying, and then with uh, some of the uh, online tools that we've got, I can pick up the winds, the ceiling heights, even wave heights, depending on whether or not they have to jump, uh, jump the plane. Right. So. So so last week, was it Odette? Was a hurricane out or a yep. tropical storm? Adet. Was it a top tropical storm or was it a hurricane? Tropical when? storm only. So were you going around that or like you must uh, have been really busy last week, were you? Well, for Odette, we were actually in port. It's uh, oh, right. Larry. 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 Yeah, Larry, we were uh, keeping a close eye on it because uh, the more it was going, okay, okay, now it's uh, 24 hours out. We're seeing some four to five meter waves and then it's like, okay, so where are the waves the lowest? Okay, they're somewhere in Boston. So, oh, okay, yeah. we tried to avoid it and then we got lucky. We got nice weather, one to two meter seas only. Wow. Well, I can tell you, I was living here uh, that w when that hit. That was a hurricane uh, category Cat one. one. Cat one when it hit. And I know uh, the locals, of which I'm one, were like, thank God it was not more than a one. I can't imagine living through a category four. Right. Like. The yeah, intensity no. of that Category 1 well, was crazy. Just when it hit the coast of Newfoundland, the eye of the storm was 14 meter waves. Wow. So it was 155 kilometer winds. That's incredible. I know. I mean, some gusts around the area I was uh, we got up to, I think we got 144 um, in a couple of spots. But I could hear the nails creaking in my house, and I was like, okay. Yeah, so. Some of the wind sensors around here couldn't even uh, yeah. pick couldn't keep up. See, I'm a bit of a weather geek too, right? I was going to say, <laughs> you really hit Jerry's sweet spot here. He loves the weather. So Absolutely. that's fantastic. Listen, it's a very important job you have, right? I mean, you're on a moving platform in the middle of the ocean. People yeah. are relying on you to give them accurate information. Yep. And then the complexity of an aircraft on top of that, they need accurate information. Oh, yeah. You must feel the pressure all the time. Uh, the first day, it was a little uh, okay. Let's get to this, but after a couple of days, it's like, okay, I've got my rhythm, right. do my um, do my briefs, get all my stuff, and usually I wake up at 5.30 in the morning, get up to my computer around 5.45, and then I download all the weather that I'm going to need, all the charts, and then kind of go backwards from there. Wow. What a great interview. Not a lot of people understand that there's that level of complexity to forecast the weather on board a ship, yeah. particularly with an aircraft on board. So. What would you tell somebody who's looking at this as a career right now? You've been around the military all of your life. What were your yeah. thoughts be? For me, everyone that I meet is get it, join the forces. There's actually nothing better. Like, I don't regret. Even sometimes it gets a little rough. Mm. You're away from home. You're away from family. But with technology nowadays, there's no problems. And you get to meet a lot of wonderful people and go to wonderful places. What another great addition of Gale Force Winds. And Pascal, I'm sure glad that you made a port visit to St. John's and took the time out today to explain to us what a meteorological technician does on board a Canadian warship. So thank you very much. No problem. Great. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that make a ship function, and there's a lot of parts of the functioning of a ship that, quite frankly, most Canadians or most people don't quite understand. 
There's a whole cell within the ship here that handles all the financial transactions because it's a big operation moving a warship around the world and we're cer certainly fortunate to have one of the financial clerks join us here today on Gale Force Winds. Joanna, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? For sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Joanna uh, on ship. We go by last name, so um, I'm Sailor First Class uh, Hermosura. I'm one of the uh, financial services administrators of the ship here in HMCS Toronto. Where are you from, Joanna? So I'm. It's kind of complicated. Well, that's so good. from the beginning, I, I was born in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I'm Filipino, but that's where my uh, parents met and where I was born. So I stayed there for about five years. And then after that, um, I was moved to uh, my grandparents in the Philippines. So I stayed there for about 10 years. Okay. And uh, after that, we followed my mom who was wor working here in Canada. So we moved here um, in Canada, specifically Winnipeg back in 2011. Yeah. So you were living in Winnipeg. How did you find your way to the Navy? Okay, so um, it all started when I was in my I think second year of university. Um, I was studying accounting back then and um, as a part time I was working at an ice cream place. Um, for those of you who are from Winnipeg, you probably know the fork. So um, I was working at an at a uh, ice cream place there and um, I decided I wanted my next job to be somewhat accounting related. So when I was looking for online jobs on Kijiji, I saw a post saying like, oh, HMCS Chippewa is hiring financial services administrators and um, it's a uniform job, blah, blah, blah. So it kind of piqued my interest. And uh, at the same time, I was in a student group in my university and it just so happened that Two of my friends were also working at that unit. So when I asked them, like, oh, hey, I saw this job post, kind of curious about it. Can you tell me all about what's it, what it's about? And um, they said, yeah, you should try to join it. It's really cool. You get to see um, you know, places, meet new pre people, and travel and all that stuff. So that sort of um, piqued my interest. And I uh, um, asked a bunch of few more questions and um, the week after I asked a question to my friend he was driving me around like oh you know what I'll take you to my recu recruiter okay. <laughs> so uh, he introduced me and then next thing you know after like a month or so I was already leaving for my basic training are you kidding me yeah like <laughs> it was very fast so um, wow. I, I did not know what to expect I was just going with the flow right yeah tell me about your basic training how was that um it was um, so my basic training was um, in Balcarche yep. um, in Quebec. Hmm. I'm trying to remember. So it, it's very different from the Red Force training. Right. So for us, uh, uh, Naval Reserves, uh, we slept in tents right. for like six to seven weeks, and um, I was in I was there training with about. 40 to 50 people right. so it was very um, challenging at first because right. you're in there with a bunch of uh, different people strangers right? yeah exactly you and make good friends yeah yeah right. so mostly the people that I went to course with were high school students yeah. and then we also had the other one and were they were about like 40 to 50 years old so at first it was very hard to uh, okay. make the connections and right. stuff like that but closer to the end uh, of the course our last week we were like oh no this is our last day together right. and we were almost like teared up right. because yeah, uh, yeah. we've been through uh, together like through so much so yeah it, it was a bit hard at first but at the end you kind of like you, you kind of miss it. Yeah. Like you go back to the, all the, the crazy stuff with it. I'm like, oh, I, we can't believe we did that. And so. Joanna, I can tell by the smile on your face, you kind of enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, actually. Yeah. Um, I like trying out new things and right. learning. And um, um, every time I go to a different place, it's always like there's always new things to learn. So right. I, I love it, especially like meeting new people too. Right. 
So you're on an incredible ship here, HMCS Toronto. A lot of a lot of moving parts here. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you do on board? Okay, so um, trying to think. So just a bit of a background. I just joined the ship a couple months ago. Sure, sure. So I'm a very new as a sailor. Yeah. Um, I'm still learning all the all uh, all my tasks, right. but for mainly. Um, even though we're, our office is called the pay office, we don't actually get involved with uh, our members' pay. Right. But we do, we are in charge of our, our, our ship's bills, so those are the stuff that we pay for. And if we have uh, members that are having to travel out of the province or out of ship, so we, have, we do all their travel paperwork for them. Right. Yeah. And do you have secondary duties on the ship? Absolutely. What so. This one I just learned most of the our ship duties as well recently. Um, so when you're on ship, you do a lot of uh, cleaning stations. So right. basically, we have like an hour or two per day where we're assigned uh, spots and we have to clean them for a good hour. And then right. later on, like they get like inspected right. and stuff. Um, also, for certain types of emergencies, we have different roles. Um, so. For one of our emergency stations, um, my role is uh, to be uh, up in the uh, aft casual clearing team. Oh, wow. So we do respond for any like casualties that are, that are out there when uh, something happens to the ship. Something yeah. like that. Um, you've had a great journey. I mean, you've come from Saudi Arabia to the Philippines or Winnipeg. Here you are on board mm -hmm. HMCS Toronto based out of Halifax. If you had a piece of advice for somebody that was considering joining the Navy, what would that be? I would say ju just try it because uh, that's what happened to me. At first, I was very curious. Like I thought it's not the right fit for me. Like before I joined, oh. I wasn't like physically fit to pass like, right. anything. And uh, I know it sounds intimidating, but like um, once you join, um, it's it's a definitely great experience. Because, like I said early, you, earlier, you get to meet new people, you get to travel to new places that you've never been before. So that's one thing that I like the most about being the, the Navy. So this is your first time in St. John's, Newfoundland? Yes, it is. How did you yeah, enjoy it? I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a unique place, eh? Yeah, yeah, Great. exactly. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been screeched yet, but I'm hoping like that I'll be coming back Next here. Next time you come back. Yeah. There's still Screech going to be here when you come back. Exactly. <laughs> You'll get Screeched in. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm sure glad that you made this journey and found your way to the Canadian Navy. I have a feeling that the ship is better with you in it. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Well, here we are on board HMCS Toronto, and I want to tell you, there's a lot of moving parts to this ship. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of things that make it all yeah. work. It's almost 30 occupations on board this ship, and this uh, is a really interesting conversation we're about to have. So Megan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Megan Ivney. I'm a sailor third class. Um, I'm a steward on ship the, with the Toronto. Uh, yeah, I've been in for two years now, and uh, I really let, enjoy it. Yeah, cool. I'm probably going to keep doing this for my whole life. <laughs> so yeah. two years, you joined just part of the pandemic? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah right. I was lucky. Wow. Where yeah. are you from originally, Megan? I'm from the valley, in like Annapolis Valley in Kent Hill, okay. yeah, in uh, Nova Scotia. Right. Yeah. And what was the influence to kind of join the military? Uh, well, both my parents are military, actually. They were clerks, oh, wow. and they were Air Force. And I wanted to fly also, Right. but so I heard steward can go flight steward, Yeah. so I can I'm just going to be on ship right now, but after I get my QL5s, I can go on a plane oh, wow. and hopefully get that done. So what did mom and dad do in the Air Force? Uh, they were clerks. They were so both clerks? Yeah, okay. both. Yeah. Wow. And so yeah. you were living out in Greenwood, is that where? Yeah, that's our final posting area. Right. And where else did you live? <laughs> uh, I lived in Borden, Petawawa, Cold Lake. And then we finished in Greenwood. Right. Yeah. Any sisters, brothers? Any? I have five sisters. Oh my goodness gracious. Yes. Five. Yeah, five, five sisters. Wow. Sisters. Are any of them in the military? <laughs> no, I'm the only one. <laughs> Are they older, younger? I have three older and two younger. Oh wow. Yes. Six <laughs> girls in the family. Yeah. Wow. My, my dad has a great time. Well, that's <laughs> only boy. <laughs> that's incredible. So uh, you're from Greenwood down in the mm -hmm. valley area there. You join. 
yeah. uh, the armed forces, and you make it as far as Halifax on a ship. Where yes. did you do basic training? Oh, I did it in Saint Jean, okay. in uh, Quebec. Yeah. yeah. How was that experience? It was definitely lovely. Was it? <laughs> it was okay. Yeah. yeah. It it was tough, but yeah. I had fun. I got right. a lot of experience yeah. out of it. Met some good friends, I'm sure. Oh yeah, and then I'm working on ship with some of them. And Is that right? Yeah. Well, that must be kind of a neat experience. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, right on. So, uh, tell me exactly what a steward does on board the ship. So we take care of the wardroom. We serve okay. all the officers their meals, right. and like we keep keep it tidied, and mm -hmm. um, we bring up all the meals from the galley up to the second deck, and right. we serve them. Right. And we can also do CO steward, which I'm taking over right now for the current CO steward. Right. And you serve the CO like make sure he gets his meals when he's off work, like off work. Right. When he's not busy. So yeah. He gets time to actually eat. Just kind of right on. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, is there any secondary duties you have on board the ship? We are actually a casualty clearing team. So right. I help the dock in sick bay and like do all the casualty clearing and first aid. And How cool is that? Yeah. Really a very diverse yeah. mixture of yes. duties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I serve people by day and yeah. at night I help them sometimes. Right. <laughs> it must be amazing going to sea on board a ship, is it? It is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, Did I you think it. that you'd be doing that? I had no idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they don't really explain that well to you when yeah. you're in ba like before basic training, but then you get here and it's like, totally crazy but right. you get really used to it and it's really fun and i bet the camaraderie on the ship and everything is fantastic right? oh yeah you meet a lot of people all right. different types of people actually yeah yeah and it's awesome <laughs> and so you guys just came from a port visit in yeah. st john's newfoundland how oh, was yeah. that it was really fun was yeah. that your first port visit it was yeah, yeah i i had a blast is that right yeah. Yeah, <laughs> good for you so you know uh You've, had, you, you've already had a great journey in yeah. the Navy and in the Armed Forces and it sounds to me like you're going to make a full career of it and you're yes. looking forward to becoming a flight <laughs> steward and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What piece of advice would you give to somebody who might be considering this as an occupation? I say just jump into it and yeah. just go with it yeah. and it'll you'll get lots of experiences with whatever you're doing and like just all the different trades and everything like this one's you get like a lot of creativity so like making trays and stuff. You yeah. get to put a lot of creativity, like creative aspects into it. Right. So it's kind of cool. And you get to see the world. Yes, and the world too. Yeah. <laughs> and float in a boat. <laughs> Starting with St. John's, Newfoundland. Yes. And it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Megan, you're a fantastic spokesman for the Canadian <laughs> Forces, I can tell you. With only Thank two you. years in. Mom and Dad are very proud of you, no uh, doubt. Thanks, yeah. Great. Thanks very much, Megan. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Good. Great. So here we are on the bridge of HMCS Toronto, and I want to tell you, there is a lot of things happening up here. There's a lot of people doing various things, and everybody seems to be working together as a team. We're certainly happy to have our next guest join us, and he's going to tell us what it's all about to be a naval communicator on board this ship. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi. So, Matt, like I said, my name's uh, Sailor Second Class Malachi Matt. I've uh, been with the forces now for just over six years. I uh, started off as a reservist at HMC as Hunter, NAVCOM the whole time, uh, and I just recently switched over to the regular force in March of this year. Wow, you jumped fast into your career. You're obviously very proud of it. So, yes. but where did you come from? So uh, I came from Windsor, Ontario. Yeah. Um, I had gone to high school in uh, an amazing school. I loved it. Uh, and then I ended up going to college for human resources. Uh, but that whole time I was uh, in the reserves. So right. um, wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do. Had an idea. Um, and then having the reserves, I f fell back on that and came, uh, came to the uh, regular force. And I have enjoyed every minute of it. Short time. But I've enjoyed how long, it. How long is that again? Did you say you were been in the regular force? Uh, just over six months now. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So still relatively new. Right. What made you join the reserve? So I wanted to do something different. Right. Um, a lot of my friends uh, that were finishing high school around uh, the same time I was, you know, they were going getting summer jobs in stores and restaurants and so right. on. And I've always been the one to seek something different, you know, a little bit out of the ordinary. And uh, I remember uh, my first year of high school, the Naval Reserve uh, bus had come to my school yeah. and uh, I was too young to join. Yeah. So uh, when I was finally old enough, I remembered that experience that I had and I said, you know what? I can do this right and uh, the opportunities that they had it was perfect worked around my schedule I could go away on weekends um, go away for the summer and gain that awesome employment not only the employment but the amazing experience that the Navy had has offered me do you remember who the name of the recruiter was to be completely honest I do not does at the Petty time. Officer John Lavoie ring a bell 
No, you believe it or not, no, it doesn't. Okay, right. great, because I know he was a heck of a recruiter down in that part of Canada, and you recruited a lot of great people for the Navy. So tell me now, what exactly do you do on board? So uh, as a naval communicator, um, uh, we one of the biggest things that we do is we use the radios. We talk to uh, different forms of traffic, so you know, coming in and out of harbor. Uh, we talk to different ships, um, and not only that, we do... Um, message uh, distribution as well so anything that comes in to the ship comes to uh, the communications control room and we dis it out appropriately to whoever needs it. Right, a lot of computers on board. Who manages all of those? So the information system administrator, or for short ISA, right. um, for they manage everything. Um, I was actually one at uh, my reserve unit for a short period of time, right. and uh, gets to be quite busy. But it is very rewarding, especially when you see people working and everything works and it's tickety boo perfect yeah. and good on the go. Well, this is a pretty exciting ship to be on. I know oh, you guys yeah. just came out of port. Was that your first port visit? Uh, first on this coast, yes. Yeah. Uh, it was lots of fun. Enjoyed it very much. Right. Um, couldn't have asked for a better first port. Right. And this is, seems like a great crew. We've, uh, we've spoken to a lot of people on board. Seems like a real team here. You know what? It's more than a team. It's more like a family. We, right. we, you know, we eat together. We sleep together. We work together. We do everything. And to have, especially, and I know can speak for the NAVCOMs, we're all really close. Right. It's like a, it's become like a family. Yeah. We do, you know, we do a lot of stuff together, and even just this past port we were you know we went out to eat together yeah. we didn't try to run away and you know get have our time away we wanted to do everything together as a team as a family yeah. thank you for that by the way st john's restaurants needed a little boost after COVID. <laughs> we really appreciated the uh, extra um, money spent <laughs> malachi I, I love the way that you describe it as a family and that you want to kind of go out and break bread together and all that kind of thing. different than any other job oh 100 eh? i've i've had a, a different experiences for jobs there was a short period of time i worked in an architect's office i've i've worked in uh, guest services in a mall and nothing uh of those experiences as amazing as they all were nothing has that family or that team feeling to quite like this right malika there's a lot of people out there looking at career options yeah. right now looking at what might fit for them what would you say about this uh, for myself, it was an amazing career option. I've enjoyed every moment of it so far, even though it's been a short time on, on board HMCS Toronto here. Uh, an amazing crew, amazing experiences, amazing opportunities. I, I have many more years left in the forces and I look forward to where my career takes me. I, you know, Every day there's something different. Um, you know your job, you know what to do, and there's always one or two more things to learn. Yeah. So it is. it would be an amazing, and it is an amazing experience to have. Well, there you go, folks. You heard it right here on board the bridge of HMCS Toronto. Here's a guy who you can feel. I don't know if you can feel it through the podcast, but in his presence, you can feel his excitement for what it is that he does. Thanks very much for your service. And thanks very much for my pleasure. taking time out to meet with us at Gale Force Winds. It Cheers. was my pleasure, and thanks for, thanks for asking your questions. Cheers. All right, so here we are in the uh, office of the supply officer on board HMCS Toronto. There's a lot of moving parts as we discussed uh, to a warship and one of those moving parts is how do you feed people, how do you pay people, how do you uh, keep the logistics of the ship operating and there's one person in charge of that and that's Natasha. So Natasha, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Of course, my name is Natasha Corsell stevens I'm a lieutenant and I've been, I joined the King Forces in 1995. I'm born, I was born in Mont Laurier, Quebec. A family, a very large family. I got uh, a mom, a dad, uh, brothers. Uh, actually, all my brother were uh, in the military at one point or another, uh, in reserve or rec force. I followed their footsteps. My godfather was a military police officer, so we all kind of followed those footsteps. I, when I joined originally, I was a reservist, NAVCOM, and then became rec force, then back to reserve, then back to our regular forces a logistic officer when the children that I have have fully grown up. As we discussed already, we have a husband who's a mental health specialist at CFPA Halifax. I have three children, and one of them is actually on joined the Canadian Forces as a signalman or NAVCOM on board the HMCS Kingston. He's at a sailor third class right now. Wow. There's a lot of military connections there. Tons. Wow. So it was kind of a natural progression for you to look at the military as an option? Yeah, it was. Actually, yeah. it was a kind of challenge that was offered to me very uh, young. I was looking at what to do in university, did not know who I was, what I was good at, uh, a sense of purpose, small town, not that many options. So I thought that would be the perfect um, platform to bounce and uh, 
uh, find myself as an adult moving forward. Yeah. And that's exactly what it provided. I had tons of experience, met fantastic friends. Um, it's keep challenging me to this day. You can never say that you have achieved perfection in this uh, line of employment. There's always the next challenge. That's fantastic. Now there's a lot of moving parts here, particularly in the logistics of running this ship. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you're right. There's a lot of moving part. Overall, I will say, uh, since we're a moving platform and we go to uh, several countries, uh, when we discuss contract with foreign country, uh, it gets very complicated. We are still bound by the same treasury law as any uh, public employee, but we add the element of operation on top of it, which is mean that part have to get to us fast, efficiently, to the lowest cost possible. Uh, and in a very uh, time constrained period, meaning that if we are in a port visit during a, uh, we have a port visit in one specific location, that part have to join the ship at this location, have to clear custom, have to make it back on ship, and it have to be the right part, which make it very complicated. Um, so it is crucial that I'm fully, f I am very privileged. I have a wonderful chief that work with me. Yeah. And she actually helped me to organize all my personal to make sure that we uh, see any blind spot that we may have that might obscure uh, our success. Meaning, we ne can actually see uh, th if there's a conflict in situation with the crane operation, uh, down to food delivery, uh, to vehicle delivery, uh, communications, and everything else that we might need to actually have uh, the capacity to achieve the mission of the COs. So, like. If you don't do your job, parts don't come in, people don't get fed, the whole thing grinds to a halt. You're correct. Uh, I will say, at first I had to um, rework my mind a bit. Uh, there used to be a lot of, where's the soup, where's the cookies, and it seemed like a small issue. Right. But overall, it's just it's the satisfaction of the crew. When you think about it, overall, the, the whole ship company are here for a long period of time. It's not uh, a very homey feeling being on the ship. It's long hours, it's demanding work. So our goal is to provide the comfort, but also the operational capacity. So if we can give them a cookie or ice cream, I'll make sure to deliver on cookie and ice cream. And if I need a tactical part to ensure that the ship can keep moving and keep fighting, I will do that too. Now you spoke a little bit about your chief. I bet you've got some great people on your team. Tell me about those folks. You're fully correct on that one. I have the best team I think of the fleet. Right. I have my log chief who is in charge of personal. So anything to do with my personal, she will actually keep them in line, keep them informed, make sure they're the right place at the right time. So I don't have to oversee that. So I can focus myself on the big picture and no long term planning. I have a petty officer, uh, Boulanger, who's in charge of supply, material management technician. He is the wizard. So you go in Dremis, find me the part, tell me, no, ma'am, we don't have that part. Say, but I know the guy that know the guy that know the guy that can <laughs> give me that part. And you get it, like, I'll say nine times out of ten, he make his magic work. Right. I have a chief cook, petty officer Lane, uh, that does wonderful work. Uh, the crew is behind him, and he's got at heart that the comfort of the crew any time. We have uh, Pet Officer uh, McKinnon, who just joined us and is in charge of HR, meaning all personal administration, wheels, pay, anything to relate it to the person uh, that is working with us. We have Pet Officer Dalton, who is in charge of finance. Uh, she keeps me in line with my budget and will remind me if I overspend. Uh, and then we have Pet Officer Miller, who is in charge of the steward. And the steward have a very specific job. They are to, they're the comfort bring of the, the ship. They are making sure that we have everything uh, for the officer in the wardroom, that we have everything that we need to actually be able to go in, eat, and go back and out and do our job. They're there to support mess operation, non-public fund, and to make sure that uh, all the mess due that are collected can be spent for the people, by the people, in a timely fashion on what they want. You know, most people see a ship sail by and they have no idea how complex the operation is. And I would suggest that the warfare side and the engineering side, complex in and of itself for sure, but things are generally fairly straightforward in those areas. But in the logistics side, again, I go back to the expression, there's a, a lot of moving parts. You must stay up at night trying to keep it all organized. Yeah, I spend long hours. Usually my days start at sea around 5.30 in the morning and I go to bed around midnight. 
uh, doing administration and paperwork and planning. Uh, it is not an easy task, but it's certainly challenging and it's always rewarding when it, everything go according to plan. Yeah. Or even if stuff doesn't go according to plan, when you find a solution that nobody thought of, right? it is really rewarding. you got to be a pretty creative thinker, I bet, eh? Yeah, sometimes it's a team effort. Right. I might not have think of the solution. A good example is just the transportation we had to do on our last port visit. Mm -hmm. I was focused thinking about vehicle, 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 and uh, another officer piped up was like, oh, we have a boat, why don't we just use a boat and go on the other side of the rip of the water? So right. That makes sense. Why using a bridge when you can use a boat? Exactly. That's right. You are the Navy exactly. after all. Exactly. There's no doubt about it that uh, I can feel the passion that you have for your job and indeed the team and your service. Your service runs deep uh, with your family and now your your kids. I mean, your service runs deep. What would you uh, say to somebody who's looking at the military as an option? Uh, I think overall you have to be looking for a challenge and challenging yourself constantly. If you're somebody that love the status quo, that nothing changed and do the same thing day by every day, this is not the job. But if you want something that challenge you and will always get you out of your comfort zone, this is the job you want. It has been an amazing adventure and it's keep bringing me new adventure. I cannot ask for a better job. Well, there we have another wonderful uh, conversation on board HMCS Toronto. I go back to my expression, there's a lot of moving parts here and Natasha is holding it all together on the logistics front and I've met some of your team and they are very impressive people. That doesn't happen without solid leadership. So thank you very much yeah, for your thank service. You, sir. All right, here we are uh, on board HMCS Toronto and one of the most important things on board a ship is how the crew is fed. The morale and everything stems from this place right here, the galley, and we have the pleasure tonight to talk to the chief cook. Paul, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, hi there. Uh, my name is uh, Petty Officer First Class Paul Lane. Uh, been on the Toronto right now. This is my second time around on the Toronto. I was here uh, in 2017. Uh, just got back here again in April of uh, this year. So yes, uh, I am the senior cook and uh, uh, there's eight of us here in the galley, so I'll go back to years ago when, you know what, to be honest, uh, I used to do TIG welding by trade, and so it always come back to me, I guess, I, I still burn, burn food now, <laughs> right, but anyway, I uh, went to Alberta, I was in Red Deer, Alberta for a few years, and started saying, well, what can I do with my life? I made good money there, but uh, I just, I wanted something instead of living from paycheck to paycheck. Right. So off to the recruiting center I go in Calgary and uh, well here I am but uh, I think uh, my family back in the day there was a uh, I didn't have many family that was in the military but I had an uncle that was RCMP and I was doing the 9 Megan March in Victoria at the time and he, he said Paul you know no my dad got killed in action in 45 over in uh, Holland so I was doing this nine mega mark. So I said, I'm going to dig in my feet a little, my feet a little harder here. And uh, so I went over to Grossmore and see the family, the headstone there. So I think maybe even though I didn't have no family member there, but I think that's obviously what pushed me to go into the military, the Navy. So here we are. So St. John's, great port. Yeah. Right. Uh, the crew loved it after. Uh, bit of a pandemic we had no port visit and it was great to get into the St. John's yeah. and uh, after 22 years myself it's the first time I went into the Narrows. Is that right? That is correct yes. It must and be a great feeling. Oh it was great right but even George Street was a good feeling too. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Paul tell me about the importance of food on board a destroyer. Food is we always say, right, it's the morale. So the army, you know, they, they eat with their stomachs, right? Or yeah. they march off their stomachs. So the Navy, yes, uh, I have 240 people on board right now. So you do that three times a day plus a night meal. So we're pumping out nearly 850 meals on board here a day. 850 that meals a day? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So and how big is the team? There's eight of us. Eight of you. Yeah. So I have a, a phenomenal team. Tell me about right? it. Right great people right and I'll come in and you know the days of yelling and screaming I'm not one of those right. those guys I mean as long as they do their job and they have fun and yeah. they produce good quality food 
I am happy. And they're from all across Canada? They are from all over Canada, yes. Yeah. Is that right? With uh, multiple backgrounds. Some, I have uh, one guy, he's a, he's a chef, uh, Master Sailor Patrick Frigier. And uh, yeah, so I let him have full reign of the galley. He's my galley buffer, so. Wow. And then I have uh, Petty Officer Settle, and uh, he's my uh, production. Right. So, Great team, great team. So there's occasions on the ship where you must do something kind of special for the crew, well, right or unexpected. I think that might have happened to you today, didn't That's it? Right. And uh, I'll say happy birthday to you. So uh, we'll apologize for the little bit of a cake throwing or uh, <laughs> like a cupcake in your face during the day. Now for our guests, so you don't know, it's my 55th birthday today. And uh, Paul and his team produced cupcakes to celebrate my birthday. And I tell you, you know that? That meant a lot to me. I mean, right. I didn't expect to spend my 55th birthday on a Canadian destroyer, but I, I really am proud that I am. And thanks for adding that little bit of adventure to me. Yeah. So, so that just that just goes to show, right? Like people are away from home, days on end, and yeah. if there's any way I can provide them with a little bit of, you know, yeah. uh, appreciation, a token, a birthday cake. And it's just that simple, hey, that was a great steak yeah. or whatever. And that encourages these people to, right. to strive more. 100%. The feedback yep. from the crew has got to be important to that, the cooks. That'll give us a drive. Right. That yep. keeps you going, yep. right? Because it's long days, right? Some days we have 16, 17 hour days on yeah. the feed. That's a lot of meals yeah. you're pumping yeah. out, right? So they're all under, they're hitting the ground at 4.30 every yeah. morning. And uh, we do shift work, right? So yeah. there's, uh, there's about three that will get up in the morning. Yeah. And uh, the rest of them, I have two on night. So I have yeah. a baker and uh, I have another member that's just producing food for bread. And, and Paul, it doesn't matter what the ocean's doing. You still got to feed people, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so you, you can, the, the grill is right there, but you know, back in the day, it used to be scrambled eggs and uh, I'd like to have over easy. Well, it all depends on the sea state that day because you probably got scrambled eggs. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's such a vital part about, you know, the morale of the crew as we talked about. I mean, 850 meals a day. Yeah. That's incredibly yeah, impressive. Yeah. Driving the morale. Clearly the food is good because everybody that we've talked to on board, right. pretty happy people. Well, that's good. And that's that's the whole goal. Right. right. Absolutely. Like I said, if they're having a bad day, that hot meal might just help them. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, help them. So, and then I have a soup at Stand Easy. So, sure. Yeah. And that, that tradition has never gone away. Good. So uh, we always say we have the best uh, seafood in the Eastern Seaboard. So. There you go. You know, Paul, you've had a pretty good journey. You're obviously leading a great group of people here and feeding a great crew. Uh, what would a piece of advice be that you might give to somebody that maybe tomorrow is thinking about walking into the recruiting center in Calgary? Well, you know, uh, follow your dreams is the first. Uh, yeah. If it's something, you, you know, it's not for everybody. I'll admit that. But uh, it'll take you to places that you'll never seen. And when you've got a team like that behind you, it makes my job a lot easier. Well, the team is working real hard in the back there. You can see them over your shoulder. Well, yeah. I, I, I look at the clock, so I know that could be a little fake. But anyway, we, we, we won't go there. <laughs> Listen, Bob, being great chat with you. Likewise. I really appreciate it. I mean, your the job you do on board this ship and the job your team does on this ship is vital, obviously. You know that, but uh, clearly there's solid leadership totally. right here in the in the culinary department on board Toronto. Thanks for your service. Thanks for the cupcakes. Thank and thanks for what you do for Canada. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds, W-I-N-S dot com.